there's really nothing to fix. It's the body wants to heal. The spirit wants to express. We just have to get out of our own way. And oftentimes just slowing down is enough to make miracles. Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting-edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who is out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hey, welcome to The Exploding Human. My name is Bob Nickman. My guest today is David Way, and we are going to be talking about Taoism and slowing down. Before we do that, let me invite you to visit my website, theexplodinghuman.com. Over there, you can listen to all the episodes, read synopses of the episodes, see photos of all my guests, a little bio on myself, and there's a donate button if you'd like to support the show. That will give you access to some extra content. Also, there is a YouTube channel where you can listen to the episodes also. That is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. And also there is a Facebook page of The Exploding Human. So uh, lots of ways to listen to the show. My guest today, as I said, is David Way. David grew up in Northern California. His mother is Chinese, and he was raised by her as a single parent. And his father was white, so he uh, didn't really fit into any specific kind of group growing up. And he grew up in kind of a rough uh, neighborhood up there, and he's going to talk about that. He became interested in martial arts and then later wanted to look at the other side, which was a healing side. And he went to China for five years and studied in a temple there, and he came back and is now running a cult, this cultural center up in Northern California, Chinese Cultural Center. And we talk about slowing down and the importance of being comfortable in your own skin. An art in itself, a spiritual journey in itself. But David's story is really unique, and uh, there's some things he tells me that I've uh, never heard before. So please uh, enjoy this talk. This is David Way. I'm excited to talk to you because uh, you're the only one I've had on my show so far that is into Taoist teachings, Taoist arts. Let's first of all talk about what that is, because like we were talking before the show, there's a tendency to be a little woo woo with some of this um, spiritual teachings. But we were also talking about what's the grounded part. And as I sort of said before, uh, that my one of my favorite sayings is uh, trust God, but tie up the horses. So tell us, tell us me what you do. Yeah, Um I focus on the cultural arts of my ancestral heritage of China. Uh, I also got a white side to me and I haven't explored much of that uh, as much as I'd like to, but I've spent a lot of time studying the Chinese roots, specifically exploring Taoism. And uh, so, yeah, uh, I run a cultural heritage center in the greater Bay area and we teach all over the world actually. My wife and I do Chinese medicine. I also do movement. We have lectures. We do music and crafts and all things Chinese. Is that because you were very close to your mother? Yeah. Growing up, and you felt that that was there was something about her or about your your relatives on that side of the family that drew you to to the Chinese culture. Yeah, I was raised by a single Chinese mother, and so that's my predominant influence and I really didn't get to know my father too well until college and by that time I had inherited a lot of hate for him from my mom. Uh, fortunately for me I was able to look past that, get to know the man quite well and uh, make amends before he passed. Um, but yes, most of my influence is from my mother that raised me as a single mom. But you did grow up in, in Northern California 
Yeah, I grew up in Richmond. That's also part of the reason why I neglected my white side because I grew up in an all black and Mexican neighborhood and uh, all the white kids got picked on and bullied and beat up. Uh, and then from there, I wasn't Chinese enough to be with the Asian crew though. So I kind of found myself in the fringe and so, you know, I smoked weed, I did gangster stuff. And uh, it wasn't until I played football and I started making noise on the football field that I started to get the respect of my peers. But I had a rough childhood and upbringing. Well, that's very uh, common when you think about people that go into uh, spiritual disciplines. They're looking for something that conventional living doesn't give them. And when you're a little bit of an outcast, I think you're drawn to it even more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you how did you get into this um the Taoist stuff was your was your uh, your your mother into it uh and or did you kind of become a seeker at, at, at what point when you took lsd or something <laughs> that's interesting yes no. uh, i went to private schools you know my single mom tried to do her best to raise me by herself so she, she put me in the best schools so she could which in our area were the Roman Catholic private schools. And so I got exposed to Roman Catholicism really early. And I never got baptized, but I was about it. Like I read the hymns, I prayed the rosary, I had the brown scapular, I was an altar boy. I was all about it. But um, I was also into X-Files and I was really curious and I always had a lot of questions and I'd often stump the priest and like, why do we wear purple here? Or why do we kneel or genuflect here? Or why is the sign across these points? And that's kind of an upside down cross, isn't it? Like, why, 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 why? And they never had the answers that satisfied me. And so really early on, like 12, 13, I lost faith in the church. And uh, in my search, I found Confucius and I really enjoyed how simple and poignant and concise the Analects of Confucius were. And then I had a teacher at the time, he was like, hey, well, if you like Confucius, you'll love Lao Tzu. And so I got turned on to the Tao Te Ching when I was like 13 years old. And it blew my mind. Uh, I just really resonated with the simplicity of it, the, the poetic nature of it, the short stanzas of it, like everything about the Tao Te Ching really resonated with me. And so that was my first intro to Taoism, but I didn't really pursue it as a path until I went to China to live in a Taoist temple. The leap from reading this book and, uh, you know, being uh, disenfranchised from the church and all that to going to China, it, what happened? where you said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to look at this in a very serious way where I'm going to go all the way to China and, and make this a lifestyle. That's, I mean, you're skipping something here. I got to know what happened. <laughs> I'm skipping a whole lot. <laughs> well, uh, in my high school in Richmond, California, I went to JFK, John F. Kennedy High School, but we didn't call it John F. Kennedy. We called JFK Jungle Full of Killers. It was a very, very dangerous high school. Uh, legit in the high school, uh, only one window in the entire school. And it was from the teacher's lounge into the library. The entire school was literally a prison, solid concrete, steel doors, 20 foot fences around the perimeter, barbed wire around the fences, only one way in and one way out. You had uh, um, metal detectors at that entrance. You had random locker searches, random person searches, random classroom searches. We had on-site uh, off-duty police officers. We had narc dogs. It was literally a prison. And this was kind of around the era of Columbine. where People were like, oh my God, they shot up the high school. And then we're laughing. We're like, our school gets shot up every other day. There are shootings across the street. There are shootings in. Mm. And despite all of those security measures, a good handful of my friends always had guns every single day. They'd have loaded guns on them. And it was just commonplace. And so that was the high school that I grew up in. That's or, scary stuff, man. At such a young age to have to deal with that stuff. That's, that's rough. Mm. Well, yeah, we managed. And of the 200 some odd in my senior class, maybe only a handful graduated on time. Mm -hmm. And then of that handful that graduated on time, 
only a few went on to like higher learning of some type of trade school or something like that or community college only a smaller few actually made it to a university and then i was like one of two that left the state and uh, went to college and i was all set i mentioned football earlier i was all set to be a duck uh, the scouts from oregon were coming to look for me because uh, i was making a lot of noise on the football field and i got injured one day in practice and it ruined my senior season and so it completely crushed my goals of getting out of Richmond and going to college to play ball. And so I was depressed for about three months, smoked a lot of weed, did a lot of acid. <laughs> and for some reason, something snapped. And within the last six months of my senior year, I switched my 2.4 to a 3.8. I did all uh, um, advanced placement classes to raise my GPA. Uh, I started a club, I got into student government. I just completely switched from sport athlete to academic and did everything I needed to do to get scholarships and get the hell out of Richmond. And so it worked. And so when I was in college in Hawaii, here I am an adult, that's when I really pursued martial arts, that's when I really pursued Taoism and philosophy because uh, I got exposed to it in college more so. And sure, I did like karate as a kid and, you know, Tao Te Ching as a youth, but uh, it wasn't until college that I really made the choice to pursue it. Did a number of years of college in Hawaii, if you can call that college. And then uh, I came back to California. I taught special ed for a number of years. And while I was teaching special ed, I also studied healing arts, like acupuncture, herbs, acupressure. Uh, and I was getting more martial training at that time. And that was the point where uh, I wanted more out of life. You know, go to school, get a job, have a family, retire, die. We know that narrative. And everybody knows the narrative of go to school, get a job, have a family, retire, die. And I figured there was something else available in life. And so uh, I raised up all the money I could, went to China for three months. It blew my mind. I found what I was looking for in the temple. And it was not really a monastic thing. It was a temple academy. I just call it monking out for sake of conversation. Um, but anyone can go and anyone can enroll and anyone can stay as long as they like. Uh, so I went for three months at first, loved it, came back home, sold everything that I owned, managed to scrounge up for a little bit more money. And then I just spent the next five years there. So they speak English too and other languages to, to be able to teach? Or do you have to learn a lot of uh, Chinese to, to, to go there? Yeah, when I was a youth, I knew a little bit of Chinese learning from my mom. But it was either really, really cute mother talking to a young child or really, really angry mother talking to a young child. And so my Chinese was very limited. So going to China as an adult male, only speaking like a mother would to child, my Chinese was very limited. Uh, but fortunately, I knew enough as foundation to grow from there and navigate and order food and learn basics and get by and set things up. And then my teacher knew enough English to kind of fill in the gaps. Okay. So you, do you live in the academy or do you live outside and, and go in to mm -hmm. for classes? And uh, when you say your teacher, I, I would assume there'd be more teachers, but are you assigned somebody? Yeah, I have one primary teacher. His name is Ran Chu Gong. He's a Taoist priest. Uh, he's probably one of the more famous Taoists on TV in China right now because he's really handsome. And uh, Wu Dong is growing in popularity in China, uh, more so each and every year. And so he finds himself on TV a lot. So that's my primary teacher. But you're right, I have a lot of teachers all through China, all through the States, all through Europe, Asia. I've done a lot of traveling and learning. So I'm picturing this academy that has a variety of disciplines that are being taught. I don't know if I'm correct or not. There's martial arts, there's meditation, mm -hmm. there's maybe movements of some kind, um, weaponry, maybe, I don't know. Yep, yeah. yeah. all that. 
Damn, so, that's that's like uh, that sounds pretty interesting. I mean, it's, it's a pretty, pretty cool, cool kung fu movie. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, it's like uh, you know the kid coming from uh, America to uh, make his way in in that world. How many people are in there at a time usually that are studying this stuff? This is fascinating to me. Uh, that mm -hmm. when I first first went, uh, China was still opening up. I first went to China in '03. It's kind of a visit when I finished college. That's where I saw the Shaolin Temple. That's where I got to see a lot of the sacred sites. It was kind of like a tour thing that I participated in. Then that's why I made the choice to go in 06 for that three months that I went. And then I stayed there from there from 2007 on. But in 06, when I went, there was only a handful of foreign students. There was maybe five of us. And so because there's only five of us, Every day, the teacher took my pulse. Every day, the teacher looked at my tongue. Every day, the teacher assessed my constitution and my mood and said, this is what you're going to practice. Go to the corner of the temple and do that all day. And then I just do that until my teacher was satisfied with my effort and then come and give me the next thing. And that was the way that I learned. We just did that 10 hours a day, six days a week. And that was the style. At some point, you know, with the internet and, and blogging and all that, and I was very active in blogging my journey, Wudang got really popular. And from five foreign students, we ballooned to like 50, 60. And then at one point, there was like over like two, 300. It was huge. The school got so big. And then the Chinese program, because sure, there's the foreigner program, but there's also the native Chinese program. And when I first went there, maybe like 15, 20 Chinese kids, and like three, 400 Chinese kids, the school just expanded uh, so, so big. And so at that point, teacher no longer has time to check pulse and look at tongue and assess. And, you know, he introduced these standards and these uh, curriculums where we just do the same basics, you know, lots and lots of basic training. But there was foundational movement, there was healing movement, there was animal movement, there's weapons, there's traditional forms, there's partnered forms, there's meditation, there's uh, body work. And now he's expanded to like play music, calligraphy, uh, body work, massage, this whole new curriculum that's been introduced because the school's still growing out there. It seems like China would be... Uh, you know, when I when I read about China or hear about it, it's like two different countries to me. It's this sort of ancient knowledge kind of a thing that that is happening there, which, you know, you'd like to think the whole country is like that. And then you hear about horrible pollution and these, you know, factories and, you know, the, the repressive government. It, it just sounds awful that in that way. It's almost like there's a couple of different, I mean, it's sort of like here too. I mean, it's a, it's not just one country. It's a bunch of different sort of sub countries within this giant populace. Yeah. And how does that impact the school and is it able to function separately? And uh, you know, what's that um, like? Cause it seems like there'd be a lot of sort of heartache in seeing, you know, sort of the darker side of, of what goes on there too. For sure. And you know, you're, you're really accurate in the way you described it, because we had the factories right outside the temple walls. It was a huge rubber factory. Where I was in Wudang, it's uh, located in Shiyan City, two hours from Wuhan. That's another conversation. Uh, but it's considered the Detroit of China. So that's where all the car manufacturing was done. And so we legit had a tire factory right outside of our temple wall. So every morning we'd wake up and do our exercises to the smell of rubber. Um, and then all throughout China, I trained in Beijing, I trained in Shanghai. It's devastatingly, disgustingly polluted. Yeah. And, uh, you know, masks are a thing here now by mandate, but masks were the cool thing to wear in China. Because if you didn't wear a mask, your snot was black. You know, your beard was all sooty. Your hair was nasty. You'd sleep on your pillow. Your pillow would be black. Just because the uh, pollution is so, so dense out there. Then beyond that, you know, the modern culture, the, the one-child-only policy led to a lot of spoiled 
children and a lot of the- <laughs> I wouldn't even have thought of that, but yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the boys, um, you know, because the family, the cultural prizes having a son. And so the boys end up with these really, really nasty complexes where they can do anything they want and they can be assholes. And then the daughters, they're either not wanted or they're hyper spoiled. And then, so they end up with no skills uh, and, you know, they just know how to shop and look cute. And so you end up with this really, really funny generation and the culture was, was hard to deal with. Yeah. It's like mass mental illness in one sense. It's even though it's not, you know, tech textbook mental illness, it's like a mass sort of brainwash into uh, strange values. Yeah. And then Wudang, uh, you may be familiar with Shaolin, the other premier Kung Fu place in China. There's two Shaolin and Wu-Tang. Uh, Shaolin is Buddhist and Wudang is Taoist. And so Shaolin had already well blown up. It's already a Disneyland resort holiday, you know, vacation getaway spot. Yeah. And so Wudang was the up and coming. And so as the school grew, the town grew and the infrastructure grew and every three to six months, new building, new neon lights, new high rise, new tourist attraction. And so, yeah, it's Wudang, but we called it Holly Wu because <laughs> it, it was every year they were breaking records for tourism. It sounds like you're, you know, it's, it's, uh, it would increase the challenge of doing the work that you're doing, which is almost the antithesis of that sort of shallow, you know, materialism. And you're trying to practice this other stuff. So I don't know if that makes that stuff stronger and more important, or it's just uh, more challenging to pull it off. Yeah, it was tough um, because the temple too, it wasn't some tucked away temple. It was available to everyone to go and enjoy. And so here we are in the corner of the temple training. Then you get these Chinese tourists smoking cigarettes, blowing smoke in your face, trying to pose and take pictures with you. And I'm over here trying to practice. It's like, yo, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Like, Take your cigarettes elsewhere. And it would be so frustrating because every day you get this new flush of tourists that just come in and out. And every day I'm just trying to practice. And sure, some days I have the patience for it and I'll play along. But by and large, it really, really annoyed us and annoyed my teacher, too. Uh, but in order for us to be in the temple, that was part of the deal, right? Because otherwise we'd have to be in some other kind of dormitory or some other facility. But my teacher really wanted us to experience that temple. And so in order for us to do that, it was just the necessary evil. So of all the things that you studied there, what do you think resonated with you the most? And what, you're, what do you use the most? I'm sure there's a balance of all of it. But, you know, what did you come away with? to feel different, uh, let's use the word empowered for a second. And, uh, you know, what, what, what became your next calling because of this work? Kind of leading up to that, my first experience of martial arts when I was still in college was very martial, right? I was, I was fighting, I was coming out of a rough neighborhood. I was really trying to feel empowered and strong and safe in my, in my body, in my own skin. And so I learned how to fight. But then when I left that area and I was teaching special ed and, you know, before I went to China still yet, I looked into the healing arts because I realized I could break arms, but I couldn't set them. I could break things, but I couldn't mend them. And so uh, the progression there took me into the spiritual. And that's another contributing factor of why I went to China. And so when I was in China, I had already outgrown the fighting stuff. Uh, and so I didn't learn any weapons there. I didn't learn any like partnered applications or I didn't learn any of that. I focused all on uh, qigong or what we call yang shen, life nourishment. And so the bulk of my work and practice now revolves around that kind of qigong life nourishment. Um, but my biggest takeaway to roundabout get back to your question, um, my biggest takeaway was the view the perspective, the values, the way that I see and interact with the world. It's probably my biggest takeaway. Um, and that 
that view is what informs my choices, what informs my actions, what informs my results, what reinforces my view, which creates my habits, my patterns, and my nature. Um, my view and perspective is probably the biggest takeaway that I got from that temple. And if you could describe your view, because I'm sure part of it is, there's no words, but I'm sure part of it that you can maybe give me an idea of what that view is. I'm sure compassion is part of it because I can tell by talking to you that that's a big piece of it. <laughs> nah, fuck people. <laughs> that too. <laughs> well, that's the flip side. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, there's... believe me, I've spent a lot of time going, fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't act on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, for view, I actually have an answer for this. Um, there's a saying on the temple, San Sang Yi Nian, San Sa Shin Nian, what that translates to. Sometimes I speak Chinese, so you know I'm authentic. Uh, what that translates to is one year on the mountain, 10 years off the mountain. So as to say, on the mountain, life is such that a year passes, you age a year. Life is such off the mountain that a year passes, you age 10 years. And so it speaks to the pace and the tempo, the go, 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 produce, 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 be effective, be efficient, uh, be productive kind of value set that we have in our common era. When we are on the mountain, we just were content with doing one movement all day for a span of days, if not weeks or months. There's this one particular practice, Bagua, where you just walk in a circle. And I legit just walked in a circle, an eight step circle for six months, eight hours a day. I just walk in a circle. And so just the pacing, the value of slow, uh, that's probably my biggest takeaway with regards to view, right? Because uh, here, if we say, oh, you're slow, that's regarded as you're retarded, you're you know, you're disabled, something's wrong with you if you're mm -hmm. slow. Right. But in the temple, if you're slow, you're safe, all your needs are met, no one's chasing you, there's no deadlines. Uh, you are in a good place if you have the opportunity and luxury to cultivate slow. And so uh, with regards to perspective, slowing down, and recognizing my tempo and my pace has probably been my biggest takeaway. And it's the biggest thing that I use. I have a clinical practice and people come to me for treatment all the time. I don't get them straight on the table. I drink tea with them. I invite them to smell the tea. I invite them to listen to the water bubble and boil. I invite them to feel the warmth of the liqueur going down into their stomach. I invite them to slow down and pay attention to subtle things that are always there. But if we're so go, 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 maybe we don't recognize. It. And then so by the time they slow down, then it's like, okay, now let's do some acupressure. Now let's poke you with a needle. And now let's do something else. And then in that regard, people have way bigger impact and way broader results. But it's not that I gave them some amazing treatment. I just got them to slow down. And then the other end of that is, you know, we schedule an hour session, they come, I treat, they go. That's the same quality, that same tempo that got them fucked up in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so there's really nothing to fix. It's the body wants to heal. The spirit wants to express. We just have to get out of our own way. And oftentimes just slowing down is enough to make miracles. Yeah, because there's always this difference in when you go out, just walking outside, if it's not like busy traffic or anything, if you're just to take a walk in the park, the pace of nature is different than the pace of man doing his thing. It's very different. It's time moves differently. It's almost like when you're, you ever been around somebody who's really old and they can't move quick and, and the pace of living is very different. And, and you at the first reaction that I had, you know, and I'm just talking about, you know, when my parents got old and couldn't do a lot, visiting them was, it moved so slow, nothing really happened. And sometimes I wanted to scream. I'm like, 
do something, you know, like, let's, you know, let's make something happen here. But at the same time, I, you know, in order to be with them, I had to slow that down for myself and live at this different, like time moves differently. You get to see that time is, is very, very relative to what you're thinking. Yeah. And I didn't know that I got that in college too, because growing up in Richmond where I did life had a pace, a dangerous pace. And when I got to Hawaii for college, it was slower, <laughs> you know, yeah. a little hard time. Everybody's on their Island chill mode. And the pace of life was dramatically slower in Hawaii than it was in my uh, hometown. And I didn't really trip off it at that time. I was so fast paced. I used it to my advantage. I hustled. I, you know, I was able to get things done and I was successful in my endeavors because I took advantage of the pace. Right. Uh, but it wasn't until I got to China that I realized, oh, it's even slower here. Uh, whoa, this actually feels good. Let me yeah. tap into this. Well, there's that, that saying that they were... Uh, it's been applied to education, but it, you can apply it to anything. It's uh, race to nowhere. You know, I, that, that idea of like, I gotta, you know, get ahead, ahead of what I, I gotta get. So I gotta get to this point from a to B. Why? What happens when you get to B? then what? Uh, I got to work really hard and bust my ass so I can relax. Why don't you just relax? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Well, yeah, but I got to have stuff to relax with or I can't relax. <laughs> yeah, yep. that's that whole uh, do something to have something to be something. I'll do this so I can have that so I can finally be relaxed, right? That do have be instead of be do have, right? If I'm just relaxed, then I'll do relaxed shit and I'll have the results of being relaxed versus doing something hard so I can have something so then I could be relaxed. It's kind of a, yes. a model that we have here. Right. Once I get these outside things, then I can work on the inside part and feel okay. Mm -hmm. I've done it. I mean, we've all done it. We've all done that. It's, it's you know, you can't grow up in this culture and not be succumb to that at, at, on some level at some time. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, it's just when it stops working and you get sick, it, either physically or emotionally or spiritually sick, that you have to make a change or not. It's a tough lesson. It doesn't come easy. And, and I think a lot of the people, uh, a lot of people look at you, um, not saying you, I'm saying us uh, as a sucker for like, you looked at th those people that were moving slow to take advantage of them. They, you know, I've had people say things to me like you're, you're, you're foolish because you're not hustling you're not doing x y and z and i'm thinking well i think it's the other way around uh but i can't you're not teachable on that concept because you're not in it you can't you know until something bad happens and you go this isn't working that you can't change it's impossible because i'm sure for a lot of people coming to you as a which I would call an alternative practitioner for lack of a better way of doing it is not in their wheelhouse until the desperation happens. True. Fortunately here in the Bay area, people are quite um, aware of, as you say, alternative methods and alternative mod modalities. And it's very common that we get people, they've done the gamut of Western allopathic and that fucked them up. And so they come to us as alternative practitioners, but here in the San Francisco Bay area, there's a huge awareness to alternative methods and a lot of people will come seek us first. So you do, um, you do acupuncture, acupressure, herbs, um, massage too? Yeah. Orthopedic bone setting, body work, alignment stuff. Uh, a lot of movement consultation, a lot of pain management, uh, lifestyle coaching is a big thing. Uh, tea ceremony and tea ritual is growing in popularity. Uh, people are seeing that as medicinal as well. Uh, but yeah, outside of the clinic, I only do clinic one day a week. Okay. Because I don't want to surround myself with sick, needy people. I would much rather surround myself with empowered people that take responsibility for their wellness experience. And uh, so in that regard, I spend most of my time instructing Tai Chi, Qigong, wellness arts, tea ceremony, and the like. 
I understand that. I do. I get that. I, I want to talk about this tea ceremony that you're that you've mentioned because I've never done that. I've done everything oh. else you're talking about, like you know, acupuncture and herbs and all types of alternative stuff. But I always thought that the idea of a tea ceremony was about mindfulness. That that was the underpinning of of that. Even in even in the, those haughty British people, I think that that was what they were trying to do, whether they knew it or not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mindfulness, absolutely, one hundred percent. That's an element. Um, slow, the pace is also an element. You consider your Starbucks coffee. You order it on your app. You pick it up on your way to on your commute. You go, go, go. You know. So, the culture of coffee, at least how it's celebrated here in the, in the Americas, it's fast. I hear in like Italy and other parts of Europe, they'll sit down with their espresso and make an afternoon of it. And so they have that in that culture. But in our American common era, coffee is fast paced. So tea, uh, assuming we're actually taking the time to enjoy it and make it ritual. Uh, yes, it's mindfulness, but it's also slowing down. And so with regards to tea as medicine, you know, if someone's seeking medicine from a from tea, they're sick. If someone's seeking medicine, period, they're sick, right? Medicine is for sick people. Uh, and so tea is medicine. It's less of the power of the tea. It's more the responsibility of me, right? Imagine being so healthy that all I need to feel better is tea. Imagine if I'm running a little hot, okay, I'll have a cooling beverage. If I'm running a little cold, I have a, a warming beverage. And that's all I need for equilibrium. It's not that tea is medicine. It's that I'm fucking healthy and all I need is tea for medicine. And if tea is going to be medicinal, it's not from the power of the tea. It's from the power of slowing down and appreciating a process, you know, the mindfulness ritual that you speak of. And then, you know, it's not this chemical thing. It's like a resonance. It makes sense to me. It makes me want to come and have tea with you guys. That's what it makes me want to do. Yeah, I was just thinking as you were talking about these people that uh, this is the most uncomfortable type of person that I've ever been around. Not even assholes. People that are, when they're with you, they want to be somewhere else. Not because of you, but they always want to be at the next place. And, I, and I'm so uh, agitated by being around people like that. I, and I don't, know, I, don't, I don't run into a lot of them, but when I do, it is so... It is so um, uncomfortable you just want to go can you just be here for like while you're here they're not even there while they're there and it seems like a tea ceremony would be really uh well uncomfortable for those kind of people but it might be really beneficial <laughs> i just want to go can you just leave then if you don't if you want to be at the next place just go it's inherent to our culture you know drive through minute rice double click right swipe you know, this kind of instant gratification that we have yeah. in our culture. And always looking for the next thing. What is your meditation uh, practice? What do you like to do? Just sit. There's a number of visualizations. There's a number of concentration drills. There's a number of you know, various practices that could be done to enhance the meditation experience. Uh, for me, it's just sit. And it kind of, you know, again, that conversation of pace, you know, can I be comfortable doing nothing? Am I okay with that? And to the conversation of, you know, the people always looking for the next thing to do. You know, if, if I always have to move, if I always have to do, what would I be if I'm just with myself? <laughs> Who would I be if I'm just with myself with nowhere to go, nothing to do? Would I be uncomfortable in my own skin? And so with the conversation of meditation, just simply being still is of tremendous spiritual value. Just to be comfortable in my own skin as I am here and now in stillness, nothing to do, nothing to fix, nothing to change. Am I okay with myself? Am I comfortable with myself? That's tremendous spiritual value. So many people get antsy just not doing something for two minutes, not on their phone. They get the scratches, they get the itch, they want to move. Well, the idea of being alone with your own thoughts can be really terrifying <laughs> to some people. I enjoy it now, but you know, there was a 
point in my life where I just wanted to keep moving or, or numb out when it was some kind of chemical. I mean, it was really just, I don't like the way I feel. I want to change how I feel. I'm going to do it as fast as I can. If I can flip a switch by, you know, having a, a cocktail or a joint or something to change that. So I, and that's the interesting thing about it. The thing that you're trying to get is already there, but it's been, it's been, that's been suppressed. This idea of just being, that's what we're going for when we do that stuff is like feeling okay in your body in the moment. Yeah. So with regards to meditation, you know, just sitting still could be considered a basic, right? And then maybe some of these visualizations and these practices, maybe they could be considered more advanced and in many ways are. But if you can't sit comfortably in your own body for five, 10 minutes, what business do you have trying to <laughs> act or project or any of that other shit? It's like anchor yourself first. And so in that regard, white belt, right? Being basic is also black belt in that World Series baseball is the exact same game as Little League baseball. It's still baseball. Olympic swimming is still the same as summer camp swimming. It's still swimming. Uh, it's just one, you're really, really proficient at the basics. And the other, you're just getting introduced to the basics, right? Baseball is throw, hit, catch. Swim is kick, stroke, breathe. If you can do those things really, really well, you might be able to play at a high level. But it really just speaks to the basics. So white belt or a black belt is just a white belt that got dirty, right? I've done the basics so much that my white belt turned black, right? And so to tie all that back to meditation, just being still in your body is basic. It's a prerequisite for a lot of these other practices. But ultimately, what are we trying to do? We're just trying to be comfortable yeah. in our own body. I was thinking about when you were talking about walking around in a circle in, in the temple in China in eight steps for uh, 10 hours a day. I literally carved um, a path into the concrete tunnel. I walked it so fucking much. That's incredible. That etched a path into the ground. I would, you know, if I was doing that, I don't know if I could do that. I guess I could. Uh, that it would be a heck of a challenge, at spur, at, especially at first. What happens to your mind when that's going on? I, I, doesn't it go? It must go through a lot of um, shifting around. Like, did you ever have like a freak out where you go, "I can't do this," or memories well, come up, or you know, visual things, what happens in, in, in something like that? Cause it's so rote and, and incessant that I would think that, you know, part of it is for the body, but part of it is to see what happens to the mind and what you're actually, what comes out. Well, in all vulnerability, that wasn't something I chose to do. It wasn't even something that was imposed on, on, onto me. It was a coping mechanism. In 2007, I had endured a really, really nasty trauma that involved violence and threat of violence and uh, continued violence. Uh, it was a really, really nasty thing that I endured. And it was here in my hometown of California. And I was in China at the time, so there was nothing I can do about it. I just had to eat it. I had to endure it. And so the trauma was so severe that I couldn't practice martial arts anymore. I couldn't punch or kick. I had so much rage. I couldn't meditate because every time I closed my eyes, I'd have images and flashes. I couldn't do a, a Qigong or a life nourishment practices because my emotions were so uh, all over the place. There was literally nothing I could do while in that temple but just be traumatized by yeah. this happening. And so fate, luck, happen chance, I don't know. I was learning this art called Bagua at the time and the signature of it is walking in this circle. And all I could do was walk in a circle and count my steps. That's the, is the only thing that contained my emotional state. It gave me something physically to do, it gave me something uh, mentally to think about, and it gave me an, an escape from my emotions. So I just walk in that circle. And then the more I walked in that circle, that circle then became my container, it became where I put my pain. 
So I kept walking that circle, kept walking that circle. Now I'm in pains in the circle. Now I'm walking around the circle. I'm able to step outside of my victim view and see the full circle of the experience and all the other people that were in it and their perspective of the view and how they received it and interpret it, right? And then it kind of became my spiral staircase to heaven. You know, I just kept walking that circle and, you know, counting the steps, cleared my mind, uh, moving my body, gave a somatic release for the emotions. Using that circle gave me perspective and vantage. And six months later, uh, I'm still very much impacted by the trauma and it still comes to light every so often. However, that was very much a coping mechanism for me. I was able to carve my feet into that path of concrete tile because I cried half that time, just letting my heart out into those steps. Had it not been for that, you know, who knows? I would have flown back home. I would have gotten myself in more trouble. I made it worse, complicated, escalated more. Like, who knows? But circumstance was such that all I could do was walk in a circle for 10 hours a day, eight steps at a time. It was like seven, seven miles a day that I'd walk in little eight step circles. I've never heard a story like that. Wow. Thank you for sharing that with me, man. That's powerful. That's really powerful. It's almost like the, the universe said, you know, uh, we're going to, this is, we're, you're going to learn something from this, whether you want to or not. And, you know, here's this thing that you're studying, but no one's making you do this thing. You just, you're somewhere deep inside that your instinct was to just do that. I'm moving my hand in a circle as I'm saying it, because I'm trying to feel it, but man, wow. Uh, I'm touched that you received that uh, so well. Um, when I was doing it, you know, I had this kind of uh, reputation. Oh, that's the fucking Bob Wah guy. And, like, <laughs> oh, stay up there. You know, ooh, he was, I was just in the corner, like walking in the circle the whole time. And so I, I gained quite a reputation for being that guy. And especially, you know, people would walk by and see the, the carved tile. Because we hear of our shoes wearing down. I went through a pair of shoes maybe once every fourth, fifth day because the soles of my shoes kept wearing down. And then I remember eventually leaving the temple, traveling the world, teaching, coming back to California, starting my school, getting my school big enough. Now I'm taking people to China with me. And I go, hey, see that circle on the floor? I did that. And the circle's still fucking there. <laughs> and so, that is just, so wow, I, that's, that's a story. I never know what I'm going to hear on these things. And that was, that's boy, what a takeaway. Woo. I'm, 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 and then, you know, that image of it becoming a spiral staircase to heaven, it was just, that image is incredible that you took this painful thing that's grounded into the, you know, driven into the pavement and then made it a spiral staircase up. That's, a, you know, I mean, and that, that image must have come to you. While you were doing it, I, you must have sort of sometimes felt like you were swirling. I'm just trying to picture, you know, yeah. my biggest rage, you know, which, you know, obviously wasn't yours, but it was, you know, we've all have that, that like, oh, I, I just, I can't, I can't contain this, man. Yeah, it was, it, it was beautiful in that I got to really study the shamanistic roots of the work. Mm -hmm because these were rituals initially, and they later evolved to martial arts. But these footstep patterns walking in the circle, you know, it traces the toroidal sphere of our macrocosm, right? That same spiral energy uh, from the biggest tree to the smallest aspect of me to the double helix of my DNA, uh, you know, to the cosmos spiraling right, in the orbits of the sun, moon, and stars, right, we have this kind of circular pattern, this cyclical rhythm, and to kind of tap into that, uh, it was really magical, and looking back at it, you know, I'm very fortunate that I had the time, the space, the environment, yeah. the capacity to do that, because in America, if you're walking in a circle for eight hours a day, how are you going to feed yourself, how are you going to meet your bottom lines, how are you going to 
you know, how are you going to pay your bills? Yeah. You just can't do it. So it was such a blessing to be in a, in a temple monastic environment. Did you ever think you were kind of going crazy? Oh yeah. 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 yeah I would imagine like, is this, am I <laughs> like what, you know, to step outside of yourself and kind of look down and, and go, what are you doing, man? <laughs> This wasn't in the in the in the game plan, <laughs> but in many ways, I still very much think I'm crazy until I meet amazing people. Like right? You know, <laughs> I have a friend. He he always says, uh, he goes, Bob. As much as I'd like to go crazy, I just can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he has this 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 idea of people in mental hospitals being ultimately kind of lazy that they're. <laughs> <laughs> come on man go crazy but you gotta keep a job <laughs> and then there's some that are crazy that don't want to work because if they work they lose their benefits <laughs> yeah i know i know a few of those it's mm -hmm. it's yeah that's a tough one not to not to go oh, come on really i gotta pay for you <laughs> i don't mind paying for people that can't but for people that can, it's 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 an annoyance. It's like you just want to go. If if we were in a different environment where everyone had to work to eat, you would be working. You would, because you'd get hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I have one guy in particular I'm I'm thinking about. Oh, let's let's uh let's uh talk about your website and how people can get a hold of you and find out more about what you do and uh when i come up to that area which you know my daughter lives in oakland so i'm gonna uh, eventually oh. once this pandemic stuff is sort of toned down and i'm gonna go up and visit so i'm gonna come in but let's talk about where you are and what you're doing in your website and uh what a great talk uh, i'd rather not <laughs> this this happens frequently. Oh, okay. I, I'll just cut this out. What do you? No, 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 no. Leave it in because it's juicy stuff. Um, Taoism is non-evangelical, right? And so uh, I've never advertised. I've never promoted. I've canceled all my social medias in the ten years that I've had my school here in in Oakland Bay Area. I never had an introductory offer. Bring a friend. First month free. I never did any yeah. of that shit. Um, and then, so here I am getting interviewed on a lot of podcasts as of late and inevitably they ask, where are you at? Where can people find you? And I say, don't, don't look for me. I love I'm that. Okay. Doctor. He doesn't exist. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is, yeah. I'm doing both voices and both characters today. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I do have a website that I don't update. I do have an email address that I don't respond to. Um, you know, best way to get a hold of me is to uh, get my phone number somehow and send me a text okay. message. But I'm getting my phone number out. Either, so you have so. a phone? Yeah, I have one of those things. <laughs> but um, I love it. Yeah. You know, I actually love this that you don't. You know, because I don't even promote my podcast, which is I don't even know how anybody finds me because I don't, I do almost zero marketing i just don't do it because i don't care about it that much i just like meeting people and the people that find me kind of you know they do that i have a little bit of you know a donate thing if anybody wants to but i don't care if they do or not yeah 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 and in my experience i think it allows us to be more authentic to our expression you know i do a taoist tradition from the monastic uh mountains of china and for me to be authentic in that um you know it takes a certain personality type to pursue these these arts and you know if i'm saying come one come all i'm not being authentic mm -hmm. i'm making myself palatable i'm making myself accessible and that may not necessarily be the tradition and so for sake of authenticity i just chose not to advertise Beyond that, you know, here I am in Oakland, California, and it's a treasure trove of masters. The history, uh, which is Bruce Lee alone, and Wong Jack Man, and Y.C. Chang, Y.C. Wong, and you know, all these amazing masters from the San Francisco Bay Area. And here I am, this young buck on the scene, like, come to my class, fuck all these old guys, you know, fuck all these, uh, these uh, tenured masters, come learn from me. 
And so with regards to the culture, okay. that, that's very, very <laughs> rude. And so when I started my school, I just went to the lake. Oakland has a Lake Merritt. I just went to that lake every single morning. And I was there for four or five hours every morning, just practicing. And then the people that had questions would come by. The people that just gawk and stare would do that. And the people that came, came. And 10 years later, now we have a decent community. And now I'm busy and now I'm doing podcasts and you know, writing manuals and the clinic is popping and classes are full but I never promoted or advertised. It was always just kind of attraction, resonance. Mm -hmm. like who comes. So it grew as you grew. It just sort of happened. I love that. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking to me today. This was really, uh, really a pleasure, really a pleasure. I hope I, we get to meet in person sometime. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. yeah. Next time you're in Oakland, I'll make sure that you get my phone number for. Okay. I, I do have your email. I will not publish it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret email. So I hope that I get, I do get to meet you uh, in person. I'll bring my daughter. She'll, she'll love it. She'll love it. She's, yeah, she's, sure. yeah, she's into medicine and things like that. And uh, is very open to alternative things too. So I think that that might be a, a, a very wonderful uh, meeting. Cool. Well, thank you, Bob. We kind of just freeballed this and won it. And yeah, I'm I'm on the side of whatever happens. That's what's supposed to happen. So it and it did. It did. We got some great stuff, man. Great stuff. I'm I'm very happy about today's uh, meeting and and the podcast. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, this is David Way, and we're signing off. He's giving me the uh, prayer sign, and uh, I'm holding a mic, but I'll do it too. Okay. <laughs> Electronic prayer. <laughs> Have a great day. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much for listening in to The Exploding Human. Much appreciated. Check us out at the uh, explodinghuman.com webpage, The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman YouTube channel, and also on Facebook. Big, big thanks to David Way for today's talk. Love talking to David. Looking forward to going up to Oakland at some point here in the near future and having tea with David. That's uh, that's a goal for 2021. One of them. Not the goal. Many goals. And thanks for listening in. Have a fantastic day. Thank you.